Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the first pencil with Kathy and Mike. My name is Mike the car guy with me across the screen, but here in Southern California, as always, my best bud, Wick of awesome car gal and friend of horses everywhere. Kathy, Kathy Cruz. Yes. What up, girl? Yes, yes friend. Trying to get more straight. What up? <laughs> <laughs> What up, what up, what up? Yeah, uh, gosh, I was trying to think about something that, about wild horses, because there's a lot of nasty stuff going on right now with what our wild horses and the government. And uh, somebody was saying, oh, I didn't know you know. Oh, I know, it was it was a volunteer at the rescue that said, uh, they told me to come see you because I, I have never heard of this thing that's happening with wild horses. And I'm telling you, I, it's always been a marketing issue and it's it's terrible abuse and terrible heinous things going on uh, that our government in the name of uh, the people of, of, of the United States and tax dollars paying for it. But um, I tell you, hardly any people know about it. So I just try to. Um, I only know about it because of my friendship with you. And, and yeah. it's again, yeah. I'll, I'll echo that. It's surprising that it isn't a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. You know, with a few years ago when they had that big standoff, right? Yeah. To me, it was completely like I was blown away at how many people sided with these ranchers. Like right. these poor ranchers are just trying to let their cows graze. Mm -hmm. And those cows are what we eat at McDonald's, you know, and I'm like, mm -hmm. and that's, it goes back to marketing. It's just a great spin that mm -hmm. they've put on this. The spin and they have untold amounts of money. Sure, that helps. <laughs> the ranchers are tied in with the extraction industry, which is oil, but extraction is meaning fracking. Uh, and most, a lot of ranchers, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of ranchers are oil men as well. Uh, Forrest Lucas is one of them, and he has an outfit called Protect the Harvest. And it's, if you look at their website, it's all propaganda. It's all like, oh, the poor animals and the wildlife and this and that. And meanwhile, they're like, and basically just to give a primer to people listening that don't know, public lands are for the public and they are federally protected and the animals that live on them are federally protected. And what our government decided to do when George W. Bush came on um, the scene in 2004 is make it so that ranchers and the extraction industry can quote unquote lease out parcels of of land and most of these lands are in the west and each division is called a, a, a management area which is managed by the bureau of land management so which is a department of interior uh division so what happens is the ranchers and the extraction industry let's just say the ranchers for now uh, for argument's sake and they are allowed to graze their cattle and their sheep for pennies on the dollar and what happens to the land when they leave it is it it looks like a moonscape not where horses and other animals horses eat little the tops of of plants and so and they're part of the ecosystem and uh wildfires are uh this is tied in with many things but wildfires in particular when cows and sheep have been able to graze on the land, it becomes a, uh, like I say, a moonscape. And that's where what wildfires can start more readily. Uh, and spread all, faster. Of, all of the propaganda against what I just said is, is so, has so much money behind it. And uh, it's, it's overwhelming, honestly. And I, sometimes I have to take a step back because I'm not just in horse rescue, but I'm in horse advocacy. <laughs> Animal, animal advocacy, but, advocacy, but also mainly equine, and because uh, there's lots of laws around it, and um, and and so right now it's just so what they do. So if you've probably seen, if you're been around, you've probably seen pictures uh, that I've shared or or video that I've shared of um, where the the horses are chased by helicopters. The company That's that. Horrible. The company that owns the that does most of the helicopter contracting, it's called Couture's C A T O O R S. They are ranchers themselves, and they get paid typically a thousand dollars per horse that they chase and capture, and uh, and they do it all le somewhat legally. But um, it's very uh, it's it's an issue that isn't easily explained to people. Like 
you know, we talk about, um, you know, if there's like a school board issue, it's super simple. Like if it's a board issue that where, you know, the show, the kids are going to have a certain amount of time in a library, it's very simple to express to people and get people on your side. But the, this whole business around wild horse management is very difficult to, to be an advocate because it's so complex. So anyway, that's my, <laughs> so that's my, I don't know how we got off. I wasn't kidding. Minute, You're a friend of horses everywhere. Just, just beware of anything the Bureau of Land Management, BLM tells you, says there are liars and uh, the Department of Interior, unfortunately, Deb Holland, who I had big hopes for, has been an utter disappointment. She wants nothing to do with wild horse management, and it's in a very sad state. Anyone you talk to about that's actually involved in the actual ecosystem and all of that is, they capture the horses, they put them on uh, government-funded land, then they don't provide shelters uh, in 110 degree weather, they don't care for their medical issues, and... Uh, and wild horses are wild. They are familial. They have groups that they live there. They live in families. And they, when they capture them, they separate all of it. And it's a nightmare. So, um, yeah. So just if you're listening, pay, uh, you know, and you need want to know anything more, reach out to me for sure. But uh, just keep your That's keep how going. I learned. Uh, I follow uh, primarily, not just from your newsletter, but I get a lot from the posts that you post on to Twitter and the stuff that you reshare because that, you know, like a lot of people, you, that leads you down the rabbit hole, right? You, yeah. A post yeah. that you've shared, then I'm like, oh, I'll click that and click that and click and read and read and read. And, and then pretty soon you get it, you know? There's you a, see... just a, a huge lie that there's quote unquote too many wild horses and they're starving. That is not the case in any way shape or form <laughs> and so i'm only laughing because it's so absurd uh it's ridiculous you spend any time on the range i have lots of people that i'm connected to that are wild horse photographers uh animal rights attorneys uh the probably the top wild horse uh I would say animal rights attorney for sure but he's probably one of the top three knowledgeable around wild horse issues uh, my friend Scott Beckstead, he's awesome. And uh, yeah, I get to hear it from, you know, the people that are really there that care and uh, not the people that are, you know, friends of friends that own, you know, that have the, that are either the ranchers or the extraction industry. So, so what are we going to talk about other than the travesty that is happening on our public lands today? talk about another travesty some <laughs> some that i've encountered a lot um not just recently just in in all my years you know there's there's a lot to be said for the value of change you know when you say you want to do something better there needs to be attached to that a willingness to do the things to get better right you can't just say you want to sell more cars if you're not willing to do something different than you've done right you can't say i want to repair more vehicles, you know, open and close more ROs. I want to increase the amount of money that is made on each individual or whatever that desire is. I want to sell more wholesale parts. So it, and, and everything obviously relates to automotive because that's pretty much all I've known for 35 years. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have at least an open mind, right, you can't hear things that may help you get to that level. And, and, it's always been that way, especially in automotive. I remember, and this came up in a conversation, we were talking in, with, the, with the dealership about service and mentioning some of the components of different systems that are out there. And it's not specific to just one. There's, you and I talked earlier, there's probably right now, maybe 10 companies servicing the automotive space that have some type of service lane tools that involve texting information to the customers right in an effort to keep the customers appraised of what's happening on the car you know being transparent making recommendations you know being able to send actual photos so it takes away the take my word for it you need breaks we need to get it done now you know there's that that ambiguity there but if you send yeah. a customer a picture or yeah. a better a video hey these are your breaks we can get them done now you know, yeah. let, let me let me is, let me jump in let me jump in for a sec um my karma is a, one of them correct Right, right. Yes, it's, I think it's called my, my karma. karma update promise X time. Yes, time yeah. highway. The gentleman that uh, created my karma used to work for Toyota, 
and uh, he built a, when he was working for Toyota, I believe he built a software management, uh, there was an inventory management at the franchise at the uh, factory level for Toyota. I think that's what he did. Anyway, um, his name's Uj Nath. Uh, he's, he's a super smart guy. And I, uh, way, way back, I mean, like probably 10, I don't know how long my karma has been around, but it's gotta be at least 10 years ago, if not more. Um, I, he wanted some feedback about, um, from my dealership experience, but also from like the, you know, the online experience and what, how customers behave. And uh, I he I was involved in a couple of the demos uh, for his product, and he was the first one. I think he was. I'm pretty sure. And super smart dude. And it's a great product. It's grown so huge, and it's now you know he's up, upgraded and all of that. And I think he's still the owner. I think um, I haven't talked to him for a while, but anyway. So so that's how long I'm only saying this only because it's been so long that it's been around uh the the abil having that ability to service a customer digitally and that's the thing you wouldn't think there'd still be resistance to it right <laughs> yeah but, it's but there is yes and that's one yes. thing that it's really challenging in in our automotive space is that resistance to anything new, anything different than we've always done it, right? How many videos that are parodies of it? We've, we've always done it this way, or, you know, we've never done it like that before. Or it's the joke, but that joke came out of truth. You know, in talking with this gentleman, he's saying, well, our customer base tends to be a little older. They're not real technologically savvy. I don't think they'd respond real well to texting. And I rather, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, are you a freaking moron? But you can't <laughs> say these things, right? So I, I kind of backed up a little bit. I said, I completely understand what you're, you're, you're saying. I said, let me share with you really quickly. Uh, in 2014, I was a GSM at a store and I came up or it was shown to me this company at the time called Zip Whip. So they're still around. But the cool thing about Zip Whip, and this is before a lot of CRMs had texting built into them, they would take your local number and make it a text number. So you could text customers with that local number. And it was cool because of the customer hit call it would call the dealership so it was completely legit it wasn't you know just texting off your own cell phone which i always kind of hesitated with i said pretty soon you know after getting familiar with it i had my entire internet team using it and it was cool for me because as a manager i could look at the dashboard i could see all the conversations that were going on and i could make recommendations hey joe it looks like you're texting with this customer on a, a fusion you know did you tell them about this rebate or you know i could i could coach and help and i don't even know why I thought of it, but one day talking with um, a service advisor who happens to be a good friend, uh, he's actually still at that dealership. We've known each other since he was an advisor and I was a tune-up tech, so 30 plus years. I said, you know, texting would probably work for you guys as well. And he was like, no, no, I'm not, I don't need an extra step in my life. I don't need all that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, think about it. I bet if you ask their customer, would you prefer me to call you or text you once I have the diagnosis? Nine out of 10 times, they'll say text. And he goes, I don't think so. But so I showed him how, you know, I got him a username and log into the Zip Whip platform. And sure enough, like the very next time he was writing up a customer at his desk, then the, they were going to um, drop it off and go home. He just asked him, you know, would you rather me call you or send you a text? And the lady's like, oh, you can text me. That'd be even better. Mm -hmm. And that, that one instance alone was like an epiphany. Now, it's not because I'm a genius. It's just I happened to share with him information that just worked at the right time. And he became, you know, the store champion when it comes to texting for the service advisors. I didn't have to share it with anybody else because pretty soon he was telling all the other service advisors, you need to go talk to Mike and get a username for this thing because, dude, your response rate goes up immediately. You're not leaving voicemails and then they call you back. And if you're away from your desk, they leave you a voicemail and then you got to check out your voicemail. He goes, texting is where it's at. Right. So then when companies like Update Promise came into that store and they said, hey, we offer a texting component. They're like, cool, we already use texting, but it's, you know, it's an outside system. We got to go over here. If this one's built into the system. So they were ready to embrace it. And, you know, in sharing that with this guy, he was like, well, maybe, but I, I still don't think it would work in our area. Not a problem. I'm not going to, you know, force you to change your mind. But in general, it just 
I run into that more than you would think that I would in 2023. That won't work here. That won't work in our area. That won't work with our customers or at our dealership. You know, and, and you kind of want to say, dude, you called me, <laughs> you know, you're the one that said, hey, we want to change. And I say, okay, this is what it takes. Oh, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so they're not really willing to. I, How come I, there's so much of that still? In our well, in that conversation, there is no data to back up what, what he just told you. In fact, the data says the opposite. And this is way, way back, I remember, just uh, data regarding texting uh, for service customers, uh, being able to cashier uh, out. Uh, I mean, all of that was like getting rave reviews. And the data now, it just, there's nothing to support that stance. And I think what, in my experience with people that behave that way, they either are they have too much on their plate. They're working very hard. They have too, maybe too much work, stressed. And just the thought of changing one little bit, it's just overwhelming. It's too much to, it's kind of the same thing when you need to delegate, like you've got too much work and you need to de delegate, but you keep doing it because it takes longer to train someone than it does for you to do it. And so you just keep yourself in that loop. And there's a trust factor too. In fact, when I I, I made a short write-up of my experience and, and kind of my expression of this, and a good friend of ours who's been on the show before, uh, Bill Playford, um, commented on it that you know it, sometimes that attitude could reflect a lack of trust in their own teams, not necessarily yeah. just you know, don't dismiss it as a lack of willingness, but maybe they're saying my people aren't the right people to implement this type of change. Yeah. Um, yeah there's a big wave in, in automotive. I'm sure you've seen it, you know, going to a single point of contact mm -hmm. for dealerships. And there are, there are guys that are out there making huge, ridiculous amounts of money consulting with stores going in, you know, because they say, Hey, we're wanting to go to single point of contact, but we don't know where to start. And we're not sure if our team, so this guy will go in and it's like, I mean, I won't even say how much money this guy charges. It's ridiculous ridiculous but he'll go in and, and change the entire culture and go through and work with all the salespeople. and sometimes the salespeople that you have a couple of them may have to go a couple you know you may need to bring in some new ones. he'll do what it takes to convert from the traditional sales model to a single point of contact and it's at least for the stores he's working with it's working so change you know doesn't always have to be bad but usually when how many times has a vendor gone into a dealership and the first thing the GM says is, who else is using this? You yeah. Know? <laughs> Rather than tell me what this is, would this work for my store? Would my team embrace it? No, no, no. What other stores are using this? And if nobody that they recognize is using it, then they just dismiss it as no. What always drove me is the sense that is this is the customer going to like it? it? Are they going to feel better? Are they going to feel happier? Because most people, especially in service, you're mad because your car's broke or it's at the least it's an inconvenience and, you know, try to make it happier and easier for them. And if a, a tool or a tactic or a strategy that you can do that will help them feel better about it, that would that was always a driver for me. Uh, and, and the, the weighing it out, cause you know, you're going to, if you're going to make a move like that, you've got to back it up with some training and some support for your, for your staff and God knows the software better work. So, um, but you know, uh, one of those companies, the, um, the founder was a GM at a dealership and one of his areas of challenge, the biggest was his service department. And as he started to spend, because he was he came out of sales, so he knew how to structure deals, do all that, you know, sell more cars. But as he spent more time in the service department, then the way he shares it, he he found himself hanging out in the waiting room and listening to conversations. And you know, a service advisor would walk over an RO, "Hey, Mrs. Jones, um, we got your vehicle in the the bay, and the, the mechanic did notice a couple things that we could do for you while you're here. You know, you're going to need a CD boot; it's torn." Um, breaks this this and this it's about twelve hundred dollars did you want to go ahead and get that done and more often than not people are like oh uh no i wasn't expecting that i just can i just get the oil change and then you know, i'll come back for that kind of stuff and 
So he started going over after the service advisor would go back to the desk and just introducing himself and saying, you know what, your, your feedback is really important to me. I'm trying to better understand, you know, these decisions that like the one you just make. If I covered your bill and got that stuff handled, would you sit and give me some honest feedback? And a lot of people were leery because he's a car guy, right? But the few people that said, sure, he found out most of the times they turned down that work was A, it was just kind of put point of blank, you know, matter of fact, you need a CV boot. What is that? I don't, I don't know what that means. You know, we're in the car business. We talk about these things all day long. We have the verbiage down pat. I know what a constant velocity boot is. I know how to explain it to a customer, but if you just say you got a torn CV boot, why is that important? What could happen? What, you know, tell me more, not just no, but not until I'm educated on why I need this breaks kind of self-explanatory, but when you're just throwing stuff at someone without any explanation or visuals, and you're just basically saying, trust me, take my word for this. You need these repairs done. <laughs> you know, it's, there's, there's that apprehension like, oh shit, I came in for an oil change and now you want me to spend $1,200. So that's kind of what helped him develop the ideas behind sending a picture, sending a video, mm -hmm. sending an explanation. And no, you know, none I'm, of your, what you're saying is uh, anecdotal, even though what you said is a great example. There is hard data backing up that closing a uh, sale of something in service will always be easier and more often if you have a visual that you've sent the customer explaining it. Data, it's hard data. And I've seen it myself. I don't have it readily available right this minute because, you know, I don't. But, but it's out there. Yeah, if, it's out there. If you were presenting it, you would have that data with you. Yes. Right? Because it's out there. It's easy to find. Yeah. And like I said, it's it's just more that attitude. You know, it, before... Right. The closed mind. You know, yeah, that closed mind. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's always, you know, in, in demoing software, you end up having conversations and stuff. And you, you mention other dealerships and this dealership and that dealership. And, you know, a lot of times there's that that desire to, to get that inside information. Hey, well, let me ask you, what's what's so-and-so doing over there? Well, these are, these are kind of some of the processes and the, the ways they're using different software. Oh, yeah, that wouldn't work here. Then don't ask. Shut up. <laughs> Don't tell me why it won't work. I know it will. You're not going to sell me on it not working. I know for a fact it will. I've seen it. I know how to do it. I know how to train it. I know how to implement it. No, your customers aren't magically different than no. any other customers. No. They're the same. No. You know, your area, whether you're in a small town or whether you're in a big city, it doesn't matter to me. You know, everybody just looks for all these reasons why it's okay that they can say oh, that's not going to work here. That may work in a small town, won't work here. That may work in a big city, won't work here. That won't work with my customers. They're older, they're younger, they're stop, just stop, you know? And that doesn't mean you got to be willing to every t new technology that comes down the road, right? Not <laughs> sign up for everything and see what works. That's not what I'm saying because. You got to be careful. Well, there are those people Any too, the shiny object syndrome. They sign up at NADA or whatever, and it turns out to not be great. But at least they try, you know. Um, but what I was going to say about the people that are like that, the I, the one thing that you can do, they might be lost cause. They, there's, they're, they might be. But if there were some kind of document, uh, something, some kind of where you've got the actual data, proven data, from a reputable source, because there's out there, uh, and leave it with them and let them, or e email them, or just let them see it and absorb it. And sometimes- Hey, like we were talking about, here's some data that backs yeah, up what I was saying. You can't argue with data and numbers from a reputable source, and it, you can't. It just, you know, you can, you can, I guess, <laughs> but it's not, it's not conducive to good business. So, um, Everyone Sometimes has a different they feel pressure, you know, but there is a way in. You just have to kind of figure out what it is. Um, but yeah, but uh, yeah, just having a closed mind and not um, being able to see that there might be another way to do something, uh, you know, that I just, that isn't going to help you keep profitable. I always thought, let's, I want to be the most profitable we can possibly be. And 
uh, with with integrity. <laughs> and and so, you know, that's why you look at stuff. But but yeah, there are those that just don't want to. And and like I said, there everyone has a different idea of what is good in business and what good business is. When, you know, I, I've shared the story many times early on as an account manager, I was at a store, a Ford store, and uh, it was the 20th of the month, 20th, 21st of the month, so basically two thirds of the month. And the sales manager was asking for my help. Um, they had just split from two teams to three. So in the system, he's like, can you show me how to um, put everybody attached to their closers? And yeah, not a problem. So I was showing them, you know, go to this field, do this. And I'm looking at the numbers, right? Because it's showing their their sales. I said, I just want to make sure this is accurate. You got guys with like, you know, two, five, six cars, and it's the 20th. And he looked at me with a straight face and he goes, well, maybe you're not used to a volume store, but yeah, that number is accurate. <laughs> and without even thinking, now keep in mind, I'm an a-hole, right? We all know I'm an a-hole. And in my head, I'm still 14 years old and I never learned how to filter as good as I should have, or else I'd probably be an owner someplace. I looked at him. I said, no, I, I get it. I'm just thinking if I had a salesperson on the 20th of the month with three cars out, there would be a serious meeting, some serious training. And if next month we were looking like that by the middle of the month, he'd be gone. I don't, I don't tolerate underachievement. First of all, I take it personally. Second, if that guy's not fixable, he's gone. And he looked at me like, what? I go, there's a big management issue going on at this store, but I'm not here to fix that. I can only fix software. And I walked away. <laughs> and, and as soon as I walked away, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then sure enough, I got a call the next day. Hey, um, is there anything I need to know about your visit with ABC Motors? <laughs> yeah, did, did he call you? Yeah, yeah, but you don't what, do that now. You don't do that. What, what's up with that? And I was like, well, you know, it just was a momentary lapse of reason. He was coming at me, so I kind of came at him. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But you, you're not like that now. You don't, I don't see you doing that. You think it, but you don't do it. <laughs> I think it, but I've learned to keep it. <laughs> yeah. You keep it. And then you, you present it in a different way, a more uh, user-friendly way, shall we say. Yeah. If anything, I try to be user-friendly. Yeah. 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 But it's frustrating. What else is going on now that I've got my vent off my chest? How are things going in Facebook? Any better? Any worse? No, nope, no, nope, they're terrible. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's so stupid. Just yeah, it's another. Right, so we thing. won't even it's a Facebook ad. If if you haven't listened to, for the last few weeks, it's just I'm, I was trying to do Facebook ads for the Homily fundraiser, small little baby ad, and uh, they rejected it for unacceptable business practices, which is ridiculous. And I appealed it, and they ran the ad. They approved it. They ran the ad. And then I had to run another one and because of because you can no longer just add budget to the ad you have. And maybe you can on other things, but the ad I was running, I couldn't. So I had to get another ad that was, again, rejected. And I appealed it and then rejected again. And when they rejected it again, they disabled my ad account. And uh, yeah, so what are we, three weeks, four weeks into it or so? Um, I know you've gotten a number of emails. We're still working on it. We're investigating. Oh, yeah, I just got another one yesterday. Well, yesterday morning, I got, uh, it's word salad, and it's never the same word salad. I don't really know where who's writing it. It might be AI. It might be, but it's, AI. <laughs> uh, it's about four or five lines, one line, uh, double spaced four or five times of just word salad of complete bullshit. We're so sorry. And you're sorry this inconvenienced you and our team is working and this and that, but they sent me another a couple of weeks ago. They sent me the same thing. you you know, we haven't heard from you for two days, so we're going to close the, the ticket. And so, and then I write back in all caps, are you fucking kidding me? And <laughs> some other shit. And la yesterday I said, am I being punked? I'm asking, am I being punked? Cause <laughs> We're in our third week to be almost fourth week. Uh, what is going on? And it, it, to me, here's the thing. Like I was telling my friend, Mike Fitzpatrick, he has the same trouble. And uh, he, and so much, so does my friend, Andrew Street. But they both do Facebook ads on grander scale, much larger budgets. Uh, but they're, they've had the same issue. And I just, uh, I don't need my ads account necessarily because I'm not running ads for anything. Uh, 
uh, for Facebook and Instagram right now, except for just the fundraiser. So, but, so I can, I can live without it for a while, but what about somebody that's, you know, like Mike, who's, you know, his clients count on him and, and he's got, you know, large budgets, large, you know, in the five figures, certainly. And they're, and Facebook is just like, they're losing out on all this money uh, because they can't, they they just want to play a game. I don't, you know, I honestly don't know. It doesn't, it's no, there's no rational answer to it. So, um, but yeah, I'll right. keep it posted. But rational nothing... and irrational. We're never going to figure it out that way. Uh, it's never going to make know. sense. I don't know whether it's, um, I don't know. I can't, I've racked my brain to think how this could possibly, you know, other than the things that are, you know, that explain it pretty regular uh, other than uh they've got either ai running certain things they don't have enough people because honestly this would be fixed within five minutes with a human uh, and right. i've talked to a human i've talked to a human at the beginning and they assured me it would be fixed and that's not the case and uh but uh but the other thing that mike made a good point when i talked to him this week he said uh that because i could just delete the account the ad account and start a new one but um they keep track of that. And if you start creating too many ad accounts, they're going to penalize you to the point of ban you for a life and take down the page you're working on. And I just, I, I'm not ready to do that. So I'm just leaving it alone. Uh, but, you know, and if you were to do that, you still kept on that page to a certain extent. So there's say that again, what, what I said, your horse rescue still counts on that page for a lot yeah, so. less and less now it's it's a big page and uh but i my main goal you guys have heard me say this my main my two main goals is get people to uh, on our email list and sponsor a horse those are the two things that count and when it comes to if we want to translate that over to uh dealership related stuff um you've got a value in facebook in that an organic value where you can share content that's entertaining or relevant in some way. And that's valuable. That's valuable to a dealership. But if you're running Facebook ads and your dealership, uh, you, you, this could be an, an, a, an issue for, like I said, my, all the, the people I know that are involved in Facebook ads are, are shaking their heads and just going, what, what the fuck? And so something to be looked at and you just don't want to mess around doing something. Cause one of a friend of mine's, one of their clients was doing some monkey business, just, you know, things like deleting their account and starting a new one and Facebook will just ban you. And then you have no way to go. That's the worst part is you just have no way to go. There used to be people that would talk to you. I knew a lot of people at Facebook and the automotive part, but they're all gone now and they all found other jobs and COVID you know, kind of took them elsewhere. And now you, there's nobody to talk to. So you're, and it just, it's sad that a company that has such power and influence on things and won't even talk to the people that pay them money. They won't even help you. At the end of all of this, I'm sure I will write something about it, but it's not over yet. So, uh, just There's a lot of frustration on all fronts. You know, everybody I know, yourself included, that's working with Facebook, frustrated. Everyone I know that has anything to do with, you know, the, the transition from Google Analytics into GA4, frustrated because so much of what was promised isn't coming to fruition. It's not the way they said it was going to be. It's still not finished. You know, it's still fully mm -hmm. not baked. Anyone that's doing anything on, you know, our favorite platform to rant on, uh, Twitter, you know, Every every platform has it's just got frustrations right now. Nobody's mm -hmm. really having a smooth experience. And that really, really sucks for people in positions that are trying to rely on those platforms to get a message out, to build a story, build a brand, and receive an income from it. So it's it's a challenging time. Yeah. I would say if you're I would try threads for sure and start building something on there. They're going to introduce ads, I'm sure, sometime soon. Um, and they just created the web. I'm so happy they created or they released the desktop version because yeah, now version. I can keep it open to the tab and, and, and check it more likely. 
Yeah, and they and uh, Mark Zuckerberg just uh, just posted on Threads that there's going to they're going to introduce search. So there's the search function. So it's an opportunity as somebody who's been at the beginning. You know, we've been at the beginning of a lot of of them. Uh, it's an opportunity for for someone or a company to start fresh and 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 it is for right now it's pretty nice there there's not a lot of there's not really any bots and like and the there's everyone's fairly cordial to one another the way twitter used to be in the beginning so it's an opportunity to kind of do something different and i, I would give it a try for sure um but you know just remember it's 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 in beta basically so you're common courtesy is still fairly common there so it's a nicer environment yeah yeah, it's nicer. Yeah. All right, let's switch up gears and put the pedal to the metal and any other uh, auto metaphor we can think of as we keep the checkered flag in our sights, <laughs> <laughs> looking out the windshield. What else can I say? Anyways, uh, real quick, there's something, uh, a couple things I wanted to get out. And then you totally made my day by mentioning the band that we're going to talk about in a minute. So I want to get into them this week uh, in music at least music history that matters to us. In 1978, Devo's first album, Are We Not Men, We Are Devo, came mm -hmm. out, produced yeah. by, yeah. do you know who produced that album? No. Ryan Eno. Oh, okay. Great. Part of, one time part of Roxy Music and produced like everybody who's anybody, at, in most of U2's albums. In, a, in 1980, the B-52's second album, with the song Private Idaho, which is my favorite B-52 song, came out. This week was Elizabeth Frazier's 60th birthday. Elizabeth, Liz Frazier is the lead singer of a band called the Cocktoo Twins, which I absolutely adore. I love them. They're kind of a niche, kind of a dreamy, progressive kind of style of music, but they're phenomenal. And then in 2001, New Order released uh, the album Get Ready, which was their last studio album with the original lineup before. And what makes this album kind of in interesting to me is the video for the song Crystal is kind of a lip sync. It's these young kids that are doing, um, they're in a, a rock band and they're lip syncing the song kind of like an American bandstand type of setting. And on the drum head, it says The Killers. And that's actually where the band, The Killers, took their name as an homage to their favorite band, New Order. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was kind of a cool story. Very cool. Now let's get into some fun stuff. Oh, just, uh, it's, I just was thinking about Suburban Lawns uh, the other day. <laughs> what a great and, band. Yeah, they're, I believe, an L.A. band, right? They're L.A. band, right? SoCal, yeah, yeah SoCal band. Yeah, uh, it's, I can't, I just, I can't remember. It's been too long. So, uh, but, so you might not have heard them uh, and or heard of them because they're, they were, pretty much LA, but I'm pretty sure they went around the country. So maybe so, but they had uh, a brief bit of, of, of hits, um, hits re regarding like new, like, you know, new wave hits, not popular hits per se, but uh, the song that I always thought was cool was Gidget Goes to Hell. That was my favorite song that I can remember. And, uh, and then they have a song called Janitor and that was awesome. And the gal that's the lead singer, she went by the name Sue Tissue, but uh, her real name is Sue McLean. And nobody knows where she is. Uh, when I started thinking about Suburban Lawns, I always go to YouTube. I did not because... know that part. Huh? I did not know that part that she's vanished or gone. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I always, usually I'm just on YouTube, you know, messing around and uh, so there's a couple of, I'll put them in the show notes, but there's a couple of videos that are really awesome live of them. There's not a lot of them, but they were such a great live band because she would just stand still almost robotic yeah. and, and yeah. sing without any emotion and any mood. She didn't dance around. She didn't, she just stood very still and, but she was singing, but you couldn't tell if she was singing. Like if you didn't have any sound, you would just think she was talking. It was, yeah. it was kind of yeah. weird. To say the least but they rocked they they put out some great songs she, so she went out and and went to college and became uh, a, a like a concert pianist and and actually released a, a piano album 
It was called Salon de Musique. Uh, not not suburban lawns. Just a. It was from her training. She you know. But after that, wow. then she apparently disappeared. Which I always wondered what happened to her. And now that you know, a lot of the '80s bands are kind of re, there's some that are re, having a resurgence that are coming out making you know going around doing concerts. Uh, I I would imagine some people would like to see the suburban lawns, but. Yeah, some of them, the, the other band members said they haven't seen her or know where she is. So um, lots of like conspiracy theory rumors and stuff like that. But she's probably like just uh, an Orange County mom somewhere. <laughs> well, that's totally going to be my rabbit hole for this afternoon after I get done with my demo. I'm totally going to follow that as far as I can. Because yeah. you wonder, are the other band members like respecting her privacy or do they truly yeah. not know? I haven't heard from her in 25 years. I don't know. Yeah, they true. stop asking me. Yeah. Or or do they know they got her like on a you know a Slack thread or something? <laughs> yeah, another reporter asked about you today. Yeah. <laughs> I was mom. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. The song YouTube comments um, are her. YouTube comments yeah. are very uh enlightening. So oh, I'm check it out. Yeah. The song janitor, the 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 chorus is I'm a janitor, oh my genitals, I'm a janitor, oh my genitals. And that's because someone, uh, the gentleman in the the band was in like a waiting room of a doctor's office or someone and listening to a conversation next to them. And the person was saying, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a janitor. And the, then the girl listening said, what did you just say? And he said, I'm a janitor. And she goes, oh my God, I thought you said, oh my genitals. And that like in his head, he built an entire song around that, <laughs> just that misunderstanding. <laughs> I, I will say I actually saw them at the mask. I saw them at the mask. I saw them in a tiny bar in Redondo Beach called Mi Casita. It's not even like a venue. It, it literally was a bar. And they were like standing in the corner of Mi Casita and just cranking it out. I mean, it was loud. It was hot. It was everything a, a good you know act should have a good bar scene i mean it was just it was awesome but they're one of those bands that you mention them and nobody else like you and i can probably the, for the rest of the day go talk to 10 other people and no one will have heard of them yeah. except you and i <laughs> another reason you and i are best friends it was very surf music ish to me that's what attracted me was it was uh, Dick Dale and Deltones or um, it just sounded surfish, surf music. So that's what attracted me. Definitely. Definitely. Good stuff, too. Yeah. yeah All right. We are winding yeah. down on time. That was amazing. Oh, and, and so, OK, so because I'm really bad at mentioning my own shit. OK. Yes. Uh, sign up for I my gonna, newsletter. Believe it or not, I was going to say you make sure. As we wrap up, sign up for Kathy's newsletter. I swear it was right here on my notes. Dude, I got uh, a gal reached out, a gal, I should say, a dealer. She's a dealer principal. She's, but that it's rare to have a, a female dealer principal of a couple of stores uh, in um, somewhere back east. And she was, uh, she just hit reply on the, on the newsletter, right? And just said, uh, oh my gosh, you know, I've been, I'm reading your stuff for years and I just love this new format. And I'm like, oh, thank you nice. so much. <laughs> I crave, I crave that. <laughs> there's, there's so few nice people in the world lately. So anyway, so, all right. So that, that'll be it for now, huh? So let's clarify, because we, we didn't really clarify. Anyone that's listening, that's in automotive in any manner, I highly recommend go to Kathy's website and sign up for the e-newsletter. Yeah. It's a great format. There's tons of worthwhile, usable shit. You will finish each newsletter with something that you can implement into your day that will make an improvement in that day and the rest of your the whole life, I'm telling you. Yeah. And you'll get a couple of pieces from my meme library. <laughs> nice. The That's your homework. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna start to sign in homework. Go sign oh. up for the newsletter <laughs> and let us know that you did. Yeah. And yes, please let me know. I mean, I'll but I'll know anyway because I'll see. Uh, I see who signs up and stuff. So anyway, nice. All right, folks. Thank you so much for paying attention and listening in with us. 
yeah and uh have a good week it's labor day soon and uh so have a happy ho holiday it's I always have to do my corporate taxes on Labor Day because it's a day when I don't have clients or anything and I can just focus on left brain uh, data stuff and uh, it's not bad though. So, but everyone else will be out at the beach uh, barbecuing. <laughs> Give me barbecuing numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hot off the grill. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week and uh, take care and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.